begin with verse number one. Really thrilled my wife is with me on this trip. It's a joy to have her along. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer and being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. <laughs> and all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? I want to talk a little while tonight about the church's first miracle. Would you pray with me? Thank you, Lord, for your word this evening. Thank you for its power, its truth, its inspiration. Thank you for what it means to have the same experience, the same gospel, the same truth, the same power as these early apostles had. Bless now and anoint in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. Please be seated. We have always been the people of the name. It has always been at the heart and the center of not only what we preach and believe and do, but it is at the heart of who we are. What happened after Pentecost, after that initial rush of the power of the Holy Ghost, after that earth-changing, dispensation-altering event, when the revelation once given to Joel became reality, in the lives and hearts of human being in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. When in their first public service, 3,000 were filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized in Jesus' name. Revival broke out in that great, first century church. Tremendous revival, almost beyond our comprehension. Not just 3,000 at the first public service, but every day people were being filled with the Holy Ghost. Lives were being changed. 
the name of Jesus was being exalted. It was like nothing they had ever seen. They were filled with joy. Jerusalem echoed with their shouts of praise. They had great favor with the people. But does it surprise you that this first apostolic Jesus name, one God, Holy Ghost revival, led directly to terrible persecution? The enemy doesn't really bother us much as long as we don't bother him much. But when we start making inroads into his kingdom, pulling too many people out of the fire of false doctrine and sin, then he starts getting concerned and he begins to fight what is happening in God's kingdom. When we look at the role of the early church, of the beginnings of this last day apostolic movement, we see reflected what happened then and what began to happen 100 years ago and what is still happening today, less and less like the world, more and more out of step with this carnal environment in which we live, connected more and more to another world, filled with another spirit, led by another vision. Sure, they don't understand us. Sure, the enemy fights us. But let me tell you something. In the end, there is power. There is deliverance. There is revival. There is hope in the name of Jesus Christ. The Jewish day began at six in the morning and ended at six in the evening. For the devout Jew of that day, there were three special hours during that 24. They were set aside as hours of prayer, 9 a.m., 12 noon, 3 p.m. And although they taught that prayer was powerful whenever and wherever it was offered. There was something special about these three hours of prayer and something very special when those hours were offered in the temple of God. It's very interesting, isn't it, that some of the early apostles kept up some of the customs that they had been taught since a child. It shouldn't surprise us to find Peter and John on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer. It's what they had been trained and taught all their lives. And though often spent in faraway Galilee when they could, as they could this day, in the city of David, gather in the house of God, they never missed a chance. And so at the ninth hour, they're on their way to pray and seek God in God's house. Let me tell you, not all customs, not all traditions are bad. I still like apostolic singing. I still like Pentecostal worship. I enjoyed seeing somebody do a little running across the front today. I enjoy watching and people leaping, uh, dancing, uh, shouting, uh, worshiping. Uh, I hope that what happened at Arroyo Seco a hundred years ago never stops happening uh, among the apostolic believers. Uh, we are worshipers. Uh, we're still holy rollers. Uh, we're still shouters and dancers, singers and hand clappers and praisers of the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, hallelujah. I hope we never lose our commitment to old-time apostolic preaching. It is true. How can they believe on him in whom they have not heard? 
And how can they hear without a preacher? We didn't choose preaching. You didn't choose preaching. God chose preaching. And no matter how the world declares it's old-fashioned and out of step, it still takes preaching to save them that believe. I still think folks ought to get married. If they're a man, they ought to get married to a woman. Woman ought to get married to a man. One of each, please. I still believe that. I do. And I believe it ought to be done with some dignity, not on roller coasters and not jumping out of airplanes. That's just me. Some traditions are good. I think folks ought to dress the best they can when they come to the house of God. I'm sorry. That's just me. I'm not saying you have to dress richly or expensively. That's not what I'm talking about. But there ought to be a level of respect and honor when we gather in the house of God. You ought to behave yourself. You ought not chew gum, clip your fingernails, write notes, send texts, uh, or check your email. I believe when you come to the house of God, you ought to praise him. You ought to worship him. You ought to lift him up with all your heart. And I believe folks ought to come to the house of God. Well, I'm getting off my subject. Their new covenant experience with God did not change the, the connection that they had with God as children. They did not believe the Old Testament ended and the New Testament began. They believed the God of the Old Testament had put on flesh and walked among them. And they beheld his glory. They heard his words. They saw his miracles. He was crucified, but he rose again. And he ever liveth to make intercession. And they believed what had happened to them was what he had had promised, I'll not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And they believed at the ninth hour when they walked in that house of God, he would meet them there. So Peter and John are on their way at the proper time to the right place. And there's a man sitting at the beautiful gate. It was very customary. It was not unusual. In fact, we're led to believe that he was a known presence at that gate. The people knew him, recognized him. They understood. He had been there probably for years. He was carried there. Evidently, every day it was something that was to his advantage because the crowd's coming in, because it was religious folk coming in. Because people's minds were on God and either coming in or going out, they were much more likely to be moved with compassion and drop a few coins in his cup. This day, however, something was different. There was a new paradigm in play. <laughs> Two simple Galilean fishermen came walking. I don't know what caught their attention. Maybe it was the way he expressed his need to them. He asked, the Bible says. He asked of them an alms. He had done this. He was a professional at this. It's how he, it's how he survived. It's how he lived. He knew how to do it. He knew the words. He knew. But something was different. These men, Peter and John, had something. None who had ever walked through those doors had ever had before. He looked up at them because they said, hey, look at us. They were not bashful, backward, anxious, afraid, hesitant. 
They were not overwhelmed. They simply said, look at us. He did. And Peter said, we don't have any money. <laughs> Reckon his heart sunk a little bit. Reckon he felt just a twinge. Resentment. Why are you taking up my time? There's a lot of people walking by. I've got a lot of people to address here. We don't have any money. But what we got, what we have, we'll give to you. Now, there's so much in this story, so many Bible stories we don't have time to develop, but he expected something, and he was not disappointed. I happen to believe when you come into the presence of God, it's your expectation that determines what happens to you. If it's just another church service, just another sermon, just another camp meeting, just another gathering, just another time at the house of God, that's all it'll be. But if you expect something extraordinary, we have an extraordinary God who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. Somebody here needs a miracle tonight. I'm telling you, you're in the right place at the right time. Somebody here needs something to happen in your family to put it back together, to bring wayward children home. And I believe with all my heart, I don't have the psychological answers, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. I feel God here right now, here for a reason, here for a purpose. It's not just another day. It's not just another prayer. It's not just another ask. It is an opportunity for the miraculous. We are in this apostolic age, and God does the exceptional among his people. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That name has been changing lives for 2,000 years. That name has been altering human histories for 2,000 years. That name has been strengthening feet and ankle bones for 2,000 years. That name has been putting marriages back together, empty in hospital rooms. That name has been bringing hope into hopeless situations. That name has been turning around the most wayward of hearts. That name has been salvaging the souls of men for 2,000 years. And it is the same tonight as it ever has been. I remember when we were here, Brother Butler, a few years back to celebrate the Azusa Street Revival. There were many groups here. We were having a, a series of services, drama, but we never got the drama done. When the Holy Ghost would fall in the drama, it fell in the crowd. People started receiving the Holy Ghost, talking in other tongues. There were healings. There were remarkable deliverances in those services. We had some visitors who came from other groups, and they made comment to us. One I will never forget. He said over there, and he pointed at a big auditorium where a large number were gathering. He said, they're celebrating what happened. They're celebrating what happened on Azusa Street a hundred years ago. You guys are celebrating what is still happening in your churches today. 
We're not here to just talk about what happened in Arroyo Seco. We're here to talk about the fire that was lit at that camp meeting that is still burning at this one today. In the name of Jesus Christ, I claim it. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise up. In the name of Jesus Christ, receive strength. In the name of Jesus Christ, conquer your problems. Rise above your situations. There is power in that name. And what I like, I, I'm, forgive me, but I, I, here I am back. I don't know. I just keep going in circles. Here's what I like. When they reached down, when Peter took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength, and he, leaping, stood and walked and entered the temple, walking, leaping, praising God. It was not a calm scene. It was not this ordered, cool, collected, Well, thank you for healing me. Appreciate that. We'll be seeing you. Now, where do you go to church? I wasn't like that. This guy went crazy. A little later, we find out he was holding Peter and John. There's no indication they were trying to get anywhere. I think that simply means he hugged them and hugged them again. He hugged them one more time. He kept on hugging them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When you pull them out of the fire, they aren't just going to sit there and act like nothing happened. It's going to set them ablaze with the power of the Holy Ghost. And if you can come and sit up unmoved uh, through a Pentecostal service. Uh, you're out of touch uh, with what the Holy Ghost is doing. Uh, it is time uh, to get excited uh, about the name uh, of Jesus uh, and what is available. Oh, let's praise him just a minute. And it happened because of the name. Peter got two sermons out of that one miracle. He preached the second sermon he ever preached in the book of Acts right here in chapter 3. He preached the next one. In, in, in chapter 4. And in the next one, he's referring back to this miracle. His crowd's a little different. But the message is the same. And here's what he says. He says, It was not us who did this. He told the crowd that day, Why are you looking at us like that? As if by our power, or our holiness, we accomplished this. When we get to thinking we're doing this, <laughs> we're in for a rude awakening. Mm -mm. It ain't us. We're just us. We're sinners saved by the love, the grace. The mercy, the goodness, the kindness, 
the Spirit of our God. We were some of those horrible things uh, that Paul mentioned, but now, now, such were some of you, but now you're washed. Now you're sanctified. Now you're justified, not by your goodness, not by your religiosity, but in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God, Simon Peter said, it's not us, but the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He's the one. He did it. It's by him that this man stands here today. Never forget, our strength is in him. Our power is in him. Our hope is in him. Our joy is in him. Our life is in him. The name of Jesus was the battle axe in the ministry of Paul throughout the book of Acts. It was the name of Jesus in which the authority of the church rested. It was the name of Jesus that called the Gentiles out for his name's sake. It is the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every tongue, every knee, everyone would come come to confess that he is Lord. He, his name, his presence, his power is all we have to offer a lost and a dying world. We have no money. We have no talent. We have no skill sufficient for the need. But he is able. He is sufficient. He is all. His name, for there is no salvation in any other but the name of Jesus Christ. The miracle brought the crowd, but Simon Peter, being an apostolic preacher, did not miss the chance. He stood up and began to preach. He took them from where they were back to where they had been. You crucified him. His blood on your hands. You didn't know. You didn't understand. You did it ignorantly, but you are not absolved from your responsibility in this matter. For it was your sins and my sins that nailed him to that cross. So we stand guilty before God. We learn much about apostolic preaching in this second sermon after the first miracle. We learn that apostolic preaching always touches people's hearts. It is not designed to inform alone. It is designed to inflame. To prick the heart. To bring us face to face with our absolute need. For we stand guilty. We stand without excuse. We cannot bring any uh, uh, justification before him. We are condemned in his sight. Apostolic preaching does not preach to make people feel good. It is designed to bring us to our knees, on our faces, before a holy and a just God who by all rights should send us to a never ending hell 
It is first designed to evoke an emotional response of helplessness and a hopelessness. I can't be good enough. I can't be kind enough. I can't be holy enough. I am condemned. You crucified the Lord of glory. On the day of Pentecost, P Peter preached it in such a way that it evoked a, a tremendous response. What shall we do? They weren't talking theologically. They were speaking emotionally. They saw no way out. They saw no hope. They saw no help. What do we do about this? We cannot justify our actions. We cannot excuse our life choices. We cannot be good enough in ourselves. We can never make a construct big enough, tall enough, high enough to reach uh, the throne of God. What shall we do? Apostolic preaching brings us afresh over and over to our need, our complete need of God. And then it brings us hope. Because when they said, what shall we do? Thank God Peter didn't say, well, you know, come and help park cars at the church. Come on and just kind of, you know, get involved and hang around. You know, things will get better. You'll feel better because, you know, that's what we do. We want you to feel better when you leave. So we're just going to tell you how to balance your checkbook and how to treat your wife, your husband, how to raise your kids, that you're a winner. That's not what he said because that's not what we need to hear. When we reach that point of absolute need of God, what shall we do? I thank God there's something to do. Yeah. Repent. Yeah. Repent. Confess your absolute need of God. Confess that you're a sinner without hope. That you were born in sin. That you were shaped in iniquity. That there is none righteous. Not one. And, and bring that confession and lay it at the foot of a bloody cross. And if you repent, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins. They are gone. It's as if they never happened. It is complete forgiveness. Ladies and gentlemen, when God forgives, he really does forgive. You can lay the guilt down. You can lay the shame down. You can lay the regret down. When you repent, it's gone. It's buried. It's in the sea of forgetfulness. And, oh, but wait a minute. Ain't that good enough? I repented. No. And be baptized. If you feel like it. If it fits your personal theology. If it's what you want as an answer of a good conscience. No. He said everybody. After you've repented, be baptized. Every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ. For the remission of those sins. 
They take our mistakes. It takes our sins. The waters of baptism and the name of Jesus Christ called over us nails those sins to his cross. They are remitted unto him. They are under the blood forever and forever. And you shall. Nobody can stop it. No situation can prevent it. Nobody can keep you from claiming it. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It will come with another tongue as the Spirit of God flows into your life. Apostolic preaching will bring us face to face with our need. It will bring us face to face with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It will bring us face to face with the power of his name and the power of his spirit. On Pentecost, 3,000 responded. But on this day, after the first miracle recorded of the church, 5,000 men responded to this simple invitation. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. Then the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of of the Lord. This apostolic sermon made certain that the hearers were no longer ignorant. They could no longer claim they did not know, they did not understand. He brought them face to face with the only saving gospel. A knowledge which brings with it an obligation to repent, to turn, to obey, and to receive. These go hand in hand. The changing of the heart, the embracing of the gospel, and the following of Jesus Christ. It was born in a miracle. In the midst of persecution, hatred, cruelty, brutality, it touched a world. It changed a world until it could be said they turned the world up. Side down. Now I'm, I'm going to close. But this gospel message has an inherent power that is beyond our imagination. We do not understand. Perhaps our lack of comprehension is based in our familiarity. We hear this message. We hear apostolic preaching every Sunday. Often in the middle of the week. Many of us often listen on our tablets and iPods and Androids and even in our cars on CDs. And sometimes I think we forget the incredible power it's not about the man, the woman preaching. It's not about even the environment in which it's preached. It's about the power that resides in the anointed preaching of the gospel. <laughs> Bishop Tenney, did you mention Sister Maud Lafleur today, maybe? I knew Sister LaFleur. In fact, in the early 70s, even before I was married and then after my wife and I married, Brother LaFleur had passed many years before and she was married to Brother E.P. Wilkins and they pastored a little church out in the middle of nowhere in Louisiana called Doodle Fork. I had a fancy name for it. It was Mount Fair, but it was Doodle Fork Community. 
they always told us, be sure the front doors are shut and locked. If you don't, the cows will get in because it's free range out here. But she told me some stories I've never forgotten. One that has embedded itself in my very spirit was on the streets of Houston in that early revival. She was a girl, a member of a gospel band. This would have been after that first one that led to Azusa Street and a revival that burned in the teens later. She was there on the streets of Houston. She thought that she was giving a lengthy message in tongues. She felt an anointing come over her and she began with great power and great anointing to speak in a tongue she did not know. Afterward, when she was done, there was no interpretation, but people started coming who had stopped on the sidewalk and even in the street and they had come and started kneeling in the gutters on the sidewalks among the cars part and the Holy Ghost fell on the street many received the Holy Ghost later they were Hispanic folks and they came up to her she told me she said they started talking to me in Spanish. And I had no idea what they were saying. They had no idea I didn't understand them. Because I was made to understand that I had preached Acts 2.38 in Spanish. Without knowing Spanish. And they had responded and received the Holy Ghost on the streets of a bustling city. There is a power in the gospel that transcends a circumstance, personality, crowd size, language, culture. In fact, Paul describing this inestimable power, he said, to the, to the ones who do not believe. It is foolishness. But to us, the preaching of the cross, that's death, burial, and resurrection, repentance, baptism, and the Holy Spirit. It is the power of God. It releases the power to heal, the power to save, the power to deliver. Alcoholics quit being alcoholics. Drug addicts are no longer drug addicts. Broken marriages are made whole. Shattered dreams are made alive again. And in that benighted age of faltering religion and pagan dominance, of brutality, hatred, slavery, early death, disease, hopelessness, helplessness, they came preaching about a God who so loved the world that he came among us, that he died, gave his only begotten son, but he conquered death, hell, and the grave. And he showed a pathway. He left behind a gospel that not only forgave yesterday's sins, but empowered us to walk in the newness of life, to become not just new people, but new creatures. And they changed the world. They turned it upside down. Crosses and lions and cheering 
blood vengeful throngs in the Colosseum could not stop it. And darkness descended and error arose. Hope faded afresh until about a hundred years ago. Now, now, now we're, we're not foolish enough to say God did not have a people and that the Holy Ghost did not fall. There's lots of evidence of people speaking in tongues as far back as we can go. I believe personally at Aldersgate Street. When John Wesley penned these words, speaking of what changed him from just an Anglican priest, a failure who could not live up to his own uh, goals and dreams uh, into a world-changing preacher, he wrote of the Aldersgate experience. He said the fiery tongues of Pentecost were among us. But we are saying it came to a culmination of truth. When they ran through the campground waving a Bible saying, I see it. I see it. When a man had the courage to preach it from a pulpit. And once again they changed the world until some secular historians have labeled the 20th century the Pentecostal century. All I can say is, if that was the Pentecostal century, they ain't seen nothing yet. Because the power of God, eternal gospel, that restored, resurrected truth is alive and well and burning in the hearts of millions of people around this world. Some we do not know, nations we cannot get into, but they're there preaching, believing, living it. And the power of God is once again changing, turning a world upside down, unheralded, ignored in the media, never seen on a television screen but where people live hearts are being changed lives are being altered so I call this centennial camp meeting back afresh to a gospel unchanged unaltered a gospel triumphant a gospel that changes like the waters of Ezekiel flowing until everywhere it goes life springs forth I call us to a renewed commitment not to creeds not to organizations I believe in organization. I think we do much more together than separate. But our devotion is to Him, to His name, to His truth that makes men free. If you're here this evening and your life is broken, shattered, your family is in disarray, you're struggling financially, physically, you're ill, Maybe you're in the grips of depression, fear, anxiety rules your life. What I have preached tonight is just the simple gospel. I wanted to honor those heroes of the past by preaching what they would have preached had they walked to this pulpit tonight. No flowery phrases, no men's philosophies. They would have opened the book to the book of Acts. And they would have preached the one way, the one name, the one gospel. And I've tried to do it tonight. And I tell you, it is as powerful here and now. If you need something from him, 
All you need do is respond to this preached gospel. It is the power of God. And if you'll come, bring your broken heart, bring your shattered dreams, bring your hurting family, bring your problems, your struggles, your sicknesses, bring your failures, your regrets, your sorrows, bring them anew, afresh, and put them at the foot of a broken bloody cross and watch this gospel still work as it has always worked now I want you to come many have pressed in but there's still room for you I really feel a pull of the Holy Spirit if you're here without the Holy Ghost what an awesome opportunity at the Centennial Camp meeting to receive your personal baptism of the Holy Spirit if you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, what a great opportunity for you to be baptized in that only saving name. If you're hurting, I want you to come and press your way in, won't you? They're going to begin to worship. I want everybody to push in as